So I'm proud of Warden Robbins for a lot of reasons. It's a blessing when you go away to hear about other congregations and what they're doing. And uh, so happy when I think about our brethren here. Uh, going away uh, makes me love you. I hear what's going on in other places and, and see what the church is doing in other places in the country. But uh, it makes me love this group more. I'm so thankful for our elders, thankful for the way in which they serve, thankful for our deacons and all of you who uh, lift up the name of Christ in your daily lives. PTP, it was a great week of encouragement, and uh, I'm encouraged by the outreach of this congregation. If we include Andre's sessions, there were 33 sessions at PTP by folks that are associated with Warner Robbins. 33 sessions. So those will be recorded. They'll put, be put on pod. They'll be put on uh, Spotify and Apple uh, playlists. And um, so we'll be we'll be sharing that with you. You can listen to hundreds of lessons from Branson, hundreds of lessons from Sevierville. The church also has a subscription to PTP 365 where you can watch videos of these sermons. And so we want to share that with you and uh, you be encouraged in your daily life. Um, you can get on PTP 365. You can get on Spotify. Um, not sure what other play uh, outlets are there, um, but uh, multiple ways to listen. And so in your daily life, right, you're uh, traveling, going to work, you could put on, listen to a portion of a sermon. And uh, I was listening to some yesterday. And um, some of them you can play at one and a half speed and some you can't. And so some of them are, are, um, are very deep and meat eater type material. And so you can look through there and see lessons that um, appeal to you and, um, and be encouraged that way. So, so thankful for polishing the pulpit. If you haven't been and, and you could make it there, it would be a great spiritual uplifting encouragement uh, for you. And so we'd love to encourage anybody among us to, to go and try to make it there. We are in the book of Genesis, and we're going to do an exercise this morning where we're going to underline some things in your Bible. And if you have your, uh, let me first do a little uh, background here, just if I can operate my clicker. Um, if we can go to that map slide, I might have clicked out of that. Sorry about that. On the map, you will notice that there is a picture when it comes up of Canaan and Egypt. So contextually, when we think of the, the time and the space that we're in, we are here in, uh, in the book of Genesis where Joseph's brothers are making journeys from Canaan to Egypt. And there's going to be seven years of plenty, and then there's going to be seven years of famine, and they're making that journey. So the map that I had simply was going to show you that. And so um, once we get that pulled up, you'll be able to see that. But I want you to, to pull out your Bibles. If you have a paper Bible or you use an electronic Bible, I want you to underline some phrases here just to kind of refresh our memories of where we're at in, uh, in Genesis today. So if you have your Bibles in Genesis 40, verse 2, I want you to underline this. The chief cupbearer and the chief baker. Genesis 40, verse 2. Underline in your Bible, chief cupbearer and chief baker. So here's the picture there. Thank you for, for uh, helping me with that. Um, there's where they're traveling, from Canaan to Egypt. If you remember in the life of Abraham, uh, he would have made a journey from Ur into the land of Canaan, and his brothers uh, eventually Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, now a famine comes upon them, and Jacob, or Joseph is, uh, before the famine, is sold off into Egypt, so we have history of Israel, 350 years of Israel history before Moses comes on the scene. So just kind of peg some of these dates and places and times in your mind for just a moment. But in Genesis 40, verse 2, what we see here is the chief gut pair and the, and the baker. And uh, Joseph has two dreams in Genesis chapter 40. We're just refreshing our memories here. And then in 41, 29, and 30, I want you to underline this. There will come seven years, and here's what you underline, seven years of great plenty, verse 29, 
Genesis 41, 29, seven years of great plenty. Then verse 30, but after them there will arise seven years of famine. So we're getting a picture in our minds what is oppressing the people. They're blessed, and now they are facing this trial, this hardship, and the world is under this famine. But because Joseph has been in Egypt, Pharaoh has put him in charge to storing the grain. Remember, it was 20% year after year after year. So once this famine comes upon Egypt, now the world uh, somewhat is coming to Egypt for grain. And, uh, and Joseph is there. He's been the one that's storing it, been setting it aside. And uh, God has been working through his servant Joseph in all of that. So seven years of famine. Um, and notice verse 30, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. So when the hardship comes, we forget sometimes the abundance. And so uh, just a take-home nugget there. Now uh, look at verse 41. Here's another thing to underline. <clears throat> Genesis 41, 41. I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh sets Joseph over all the land of Egypt. So this, is, this will be important in, uh, in the history of Israel because a leader will arise in Egypt who doesn't have respect for Joseph. So just underline that. I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Now, 45 of chapter 41, I want you to underline Joseph's wife. Her name is Asenath. So underline or circle Asenath. And she's the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On. I was doing some study on this priest of On, and the priest of On perhaps worshipped a sun god called Re. Remember, Joseph is in Egypt. Egypt is not following the one true God. Right? And when we get to the book of Exodus, we'll see how much they have rejected the God of Israel. And uh, the Israelites will be wanting to worship God, and they will be prohibited by Pharaoh, and God will show Pharaoh who rules in the kingdoms of men. Now, look in 4151, Joseph called for the name of the firstborn. Who was the firstborn? Manasseh. So circle Manasseh there in 4151, and then in 52, circle the name Ephraim, the name of the second he called Ephraim. So who are Manasseh and Ephraim? Joseph's sons, right? These are his children. Through which wife? Asenath, right? So just getting in our mind, who are these people? What, who are these names? Um, why are they important? Things of that nature. Now, skipping down to 55, I want you to see this. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, watch this, go to Joseph, what he says to you, do. So the Egyptians are crying out for help. So it's not just, it's not just Joseph in charge of helping foreign nations, helping his own family, but it's the Egyptians what Joseph says. Remember, he's been over the collection of grain for the seven years during the famine. What Joseph says, do. So I want you to see how God works through faithful people. Joseph is trusting in the God of heaven, the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's who Joseph is trusting in. And when we think about leaders in the church, we think about men who are faithful to God and women who are faithful to God. And uh, when we think about leaders in the congregation, we're thinking about men specifically. But there are women who are very devoted in their faith to God. So Joseph is in this position. So underline what he says to you do. So because Joseph is following God, now what Joseph says to the people is one that is a blessing to them. So important point. Now, chapter 42 is a, a good statement here, 42 verse 6. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came, watch this, underline this, and bowed themselves before him. So underline, bowed themselves before him. Why is that important? He had a dream, right? Had a dream. Does anyone remember what the dreams were about? Uh, 
Right. Okay. So this dream, this dream is uh, uh, of the sheaves bowing down, right? And and then also the sun, moon, and eleven stars. So two dreams there. And what this shows is a um, you know an exaltation, if you will, of Joseph. And uh, and also we see that in time these things come to pass. So one of the things, take home nuggets here, and I gotta pick it up just a little bit. So this is our underlining here, but I want you to think about this. Was this bowing down in 42.6, was that worship? Were his brothers worshiping him? Respect, Respect right? Respect. <laughs> Obeisance? Uh, well, that's more of a worship word. Yeah. So this obeisance would be like prostrating oneself. Yeah, so respect. Yeah? Okay. All right. Okay. We see what happens, right? Absolutely. So, <clears throat> but I want you to see that in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, and this is just a side note. If you want to write this in the margin of your Bibles, put Daniel 2.46 uh, next to Genesis 42.6. Put Daniel 2.46, Daniel 3.3, 3, and Daniel 3.5. And here's why I want you to put that. Because I want you to see that all reverence is not worship. And you might put that note in your margin. All reverence is not worship. Right. So in Daniel, they, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are refusing to bow down to a statue, a 90-foot gold statue. And so I want you to see that, that all respect. Now, here is this sometimes bowing down before someone, um, you know, like if we were to have a dignitary, right, to come in uh, and around us, right, we would... We would speak to them respectfully. We would show honor to them. And, uh, you know, if, if uh, some political power was in our midst, if the governor was in our midst, if, if um, the senator or somebody like that, there would be some sort of, of honor paid to them, even if we don't agree with their policies. Right. Ah, oh, yes. Okay. A cultural thing. Um, good point. Amy is uh, actively, what belt are you? Third degree. Amy is a third degree black belt, so watch it. <laughs> right? Right. So she, what, she, what she's saying is they, they, bow, they bow in, uh, in Taekwondo. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. So sometimes it is a cultural reverence thing, not a worship thing. So if, if bowing, now if, if someone, if a political figure said, you know, bow down and worship me, we would refuse, but some sort of honor and respect. So it, it, these are some nuances that are important in that. Now, here are a few uh, review questions here, and then um, we want to jump into this lesson. So <clears throat> we mentioned um, the dreams that he had, and uh, in 41, 1 through 7, there were two dreams. One was about cows uh, and ugly cows, um, are eaten by the plump ones, and then the thin ears of corn of grain were eaten by the healthy ones. So two dreams there, one central message revealing the seven years of plenty, then seven years of famine. Now here's a, a multiple choice for you. What did Pharaoh not give Joseph when he made him ruler? Did again the the signet ring, the and let me see your hand, the signet ring, the fine linen, the king's throne or the golden necklace? All right. So, yeah, the king's, the king's throne. Good job. Our, <clears throat> didn't give him good seed? The good seat. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, why did Jacob not send Benjamin with the ten brothers to Egypt to buy food? He loved him? Yeah. Yeah, he was scared something was going to happen to him, right? All right. That's true. Good point. Did you hear him? He said the second favorite. So remember, 
who the mother was, Rachel, and Joseph and Benjamin. Um, Rachel dies. So here are these sons. He doesn't want to lose um, his youngest, who is Benjamin. And uh, so good point. Um, let me back up just a second. Joseph's wife was named Aseneth, and Joseph's sons were Manasseh. Excellent. You guys are on it. I love it. Okay, what did the brothers find in their bags of grain when they were empty? All right, that, we're getting to that. That's uh, today. But money, right? They found their money in the mouth of the sack. So um, I want you to see that there is, there's some different things going on. Now, keep, keep a couple of these things in mind in terms of application. Jacob and Esau, Jacob and Esau, and Joseph and his brothers in the book of Genesis are two case studies in family dispute resolution. Um, you ever had conflict in your family? So in my family reunions, I'm like, oh, sermon idea. Oh, sermon idea. Oh, boy, that, I can Bible class, you know. So, yeah, sometimes there's some... Uh, there's some things going on in families, but um, these are two case studies. Just keep that and, uh, and file that away in your mind. Um, that's what we're looking at. And it's hard in teaching this not to get ahead because I want to jump into Genesis. Of four, we're in 44 today, but I want to be in 45 because I want to keep seeing how all this plays out. But I got to hold back my horses and let Damien work on Wednesday night on, uh, on 45. So. Uh, look, look at this question here. So uh, money, and then how much money did Jacob's sons take to buy grain on the second trip to Egypt? Double, right? Double the money, all right? So you brought back money. Um, take that back with you. Take more with you because we're honest people, right? Jacob is trying to let Egypt see we're honest people, and Jacob doesn't want his kids to be killed. Right? He doesn't want his sons to be killed. Like He's going um, and he's leaning upon the good graces of Egypt that serves a God that Jacob does not serve. But he needs their grace at this time. And so he's, he's leaning upon them. And you can see the father's heart um, contorted and twisted and yearning for, all right, we got to do this to survive. You go. Um, and uh, so, okay. What did Joseph say and do when he saw Benjamin in Egypt? Yeah, we're going to get to that, but in 43, verse 30. 43, verse 30. Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother. Now, put this note in your mind. Joseph had not seen Benjamin, if my math is right, in 22 years. Joseph had not seen Benjamin in 22 years. Well, there's some different ways we get at that math. If you go on into Genesis uh, 45, when Joseph is telling of the famine, he talks about his brothers coming two years into the famine. So we can put this kind of on a timeline uh, of in Joseph's life, uh, at uh, w during the seven years of plenty, at the end of that he would have been thirty-seven. So we, Joseph would have been thirty-nine in chapter forty-four, um, and so this gives us kind of some timeline. Thirty-nine, twenty-two years had gone by. I hadn't seen his brothers. It seems like we don't know exactly how long the travel took to go back to Canaan and then to come back to Egypt. Don't know exactly. Um, you know, was it earlier in those two years in the famine when they came? And then, you know, so some of this, you know, I'm not going to give you a day, but um, 45 and verse 6 tells us um, that two years into the famine. So this gives us some indication of the time it had been since he had seen his brothers. And so a lot of waters under the bridge, 22 years of tension in a family, 22 years of their father believing something about their son, 
And um, I want you to get and sense this plot. I want you to be in it. I want you to, to, to get the different dynamics, the emotions of, 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 uh, of Joseph, because I do believe that Joseph, the way he speaks to his brothers, he, is, he takes an authoritative role with them. And uh, he's not playing with them, right? And he, he also concocts this ruse, if you will, of, um, you know, you're up to no good. You're spies, right? So can you see in that maybe that I would be upset with my brothers too. They sold me into slavery. Now I see them. On one hand, we have this ambivalence, right? Where on one hand, emotionally, it's my family. On the other hand, you sold me into slavery. Right now, Jake, uh, uh, Joseph, and God are going to resolve this. Joseph, and, through God and his brothers, and Jacob are going to resolve this. So, I don't want to get too far ahead. All right. So let's look in forty-four. Then he, that's Joseph, commanded the steward of his house, fill the men's sack with food as much as they can carry and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack and put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest with his money for the grain. And he did as Joseph told him. As soon as the morning was light, the men were set away with their donkeys. They had gone only a short distance from the city. Now, so here's the Here's kind of the, the, uh, what's occurred. The silver cup is in the grain, filling them to the max. You see the grace of God. Feed Israel, right? Let's give them everything that we can. Let's, uh, you know, let's weigh down the donkeys as much as we can. Um, this, my family. You see the grace of God in, in, uh, in all of this. Now, watch Joseph in verse 4. Joseph said to his steward, so what would a steward be? A servant, right. Mm -hmm. A manager, someone that you trust, right? Someone, a faithful a person um, that you trust. Now, Joseph said to his steward, up, follow after the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? So I want you to see this ruse, um, this concoction that Joseph is coming up with. Why have you repaid evil for good? Now, here's the thing. Wasn't the men who put the silver cup of Joseph in Benjamin's sack? wasn't the brothers. They're trying to be honest. They're trying to be noble. They're trying to get Benjamin back to their father, right? They want to do that. <clears throat> Up, follow after the men, and when, you have over, and when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? It is, verse 5, it is not from this that my Lord drinks. Uh, is it not from this that my Lord drinks, and by this that he practices divination? You have done evil in doing this. Now, here's the thing. Is Jacob, uh, Joseph, is Joseph a practicer of divination? All right. So a dream interpreter, certainly. Now, here's what we don't know. Well, some of you may have some other thoughts. Does Jacob... Joseph, I keep saying Jake, does Joseph um, practice fortune telling? Amy? Yes. Right. Remember, in their minds, they've gone to Egypt. In their minds, Egypt has their gods. As Damien points out, in their minds, Joseph is an Egyptian. What do Egyptians do? All right, they're not involved. So Joseph, knowing that his brothers might be believing that, might be playing into that notion. So, so uh, um, do I believe, now if you were to put me on the spot, if this was Q&A night, um, I don't believe that Joseph practicing divination is in keeping with his character. Over and over again, um, you know, you read through the life of Joseph. He's faithful, he's faithful. It's not that he could not do anything wrong. I, I don't want to go to that extreme. But, uh, you know, um, this cup and calling upon foreign deities. But remember, he's not married to an Israelite. So is there some influence from Og in his life? Maybe. Uh, I don't think that divination in terms of trying to contact 
you know, um, other gods is in keeping with his character. I think this is part of his, um, this is part of his plan to deal with his brothers the way that he, uh, that he judges that he, that, he, uh, that he will. It is not that from this my Lord drinks and by this that he practices divination. You have done evil in doing this. Now, remember Joseph is charging his brothers with being a spy. Now verse 6, when he overtook them, he spoke to them these words. So the steward, um, as fa- remember the brothers leave, they're going back to Canaan, and here the steward is um, overtaking them. Now he engages with them, a messenger from Joseph. Right? Whatever Joseph says, do. That's what, the, that's what the leader of Egypt is saying. Now, imagine the power. Imagine the fear. Right? We're not just dealing with, uh, you know, um, an ordinary fo- uh, folk, if you will. Right? This is a person in power in Egypt. And we're in need. We're in need because we want to get our brother back and we want to eat. That's what's going on in the life of the Israelites. Verse 7. They... This is the brothers said to him, why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servant to do such a thing. Behold, the money that we found in the mouths of our sacks, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How then could we still steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? How could we, in other words, they're talking to the steward. How could we steal this silver from you? Right? We we're honest. We're upright men. We're not spies. We want to show you that we're spies, not spies. We, you know, leave your brother with us. We'll show you. We'll show you that we're not spies. Now, verse 10, he said, let it be as you say, he who is found with it shall be my servant and the rest of you shall be innocent. All right. The steward knows that the cup is in Benjamin's bag, the silver cup. All right, so then each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground, and each man opened his sack, and he searched, beginning with the oldest, the eldest, and ending with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Oh, boy. Think about what was going through the mind of the brothers now. All right, now notice verse 9. Whichever of your servants is found with it shall die. The brothers are so convinced of their innocence that they're saying, if this is in our stack, we'll die for this. We're so certain. We're so certain that we're right, that it's not here. It's not with us. We're honest. We're upright. We're not spies. We're hungry. That's who we are. We're a hungry family from Canaan. All right. Verse 13, then they tore their clothes and every man loaded his donkey and they returned to the city. Because you could imagine, oh no, we're not bringing Benjamin home to dad. Benjamin's going back. He's not going home to us. He's not going back with us. Um, So it's a watershed moment. I want you to see the the dramatic uh, aspect. Verse 14, when Judah and his brother came to Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell before him to the ground. So notice again, homage, right? Not worship, respect, reverence. Verse 15, Joseph said to them, what deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? He says it again. All right, so they're trying to make sense of how Joseph knows what he knows. Do you remember what happened when they were at dinner, when they ate the meal with Joseph? Do you remember how Joseph set them up? How did he set them up at the meal? Anyone remember? Yeah, great point. Benjamin got five, you know, if you talk about seconds, like Jim, Benjamin got like, my plate is this, Benjamin's is five times my plate, if I'm one of the brothers. He got five times the serving. But Joseph lined them up from oldest to youngest, youngest to oldest. He, and can you imagine in the brother's mind, how does this man know our ages? How does he know? 
right? So Joseph is going along. Now, do I believe Joseph practices divination? No. I believe this is an element of disguise with his brothers, a ruse, a plot, right? He's accusing them of being, um, being spies. So, <clears throat> That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. good point. Verse 16, and Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. So Judah is speaking. Uh, Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. We're your servants. Judah is speaking up. What shall we say? Um, God has found out the guilt. So Judah is saying, you know what? God knows what we did to Joseph. And we're getting our payback now. That's what's going on. Verse 17, but he, that's Joseph, said, Far be it for me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go in peace to your father. So Joseph is saying, listen, you said kill yourselves. We're saying, Joseph is saying, no, leave Benjamin with me. Go back to your father. Verse 18, Then Judah went up to him and said, Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ear, and let not your anger burn against your servant. For you are like Pharaoh himself. The power, right? The, the leadership. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a younger and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Notice, the brothers think Joseph's dead. He's engaging with them. Verse 21, Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him. We said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Jacob has said, Don't come home without Benjamin. And now Joseph has said, I'll keep him. The rest of you can go. You're innocent. Go on. Go home. Uh, verse 23, then you said to your servants, unless the youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not see my face again. When we went back to the ser your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, go again, buy us a little food. And we said, we cannot go down if our youngest brother goes with us. Uh, then we will go down, for we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons. One left me, and I said, Surely he has been torn to pieces. Remember uh, the coat of many colors? And I have never seen him since. I haven't seen Joseph in 22 years. If you take this one also from me and harm happens to him, you will bring down my gray hair in evil to Sheol. Verse 30, now therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die, and your servant will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. Here, my father's going to die if I don't bring Benjamin home. I'll stand in his place. I'll defend him. Here is this uh, exchange that's going on, and... Um, Verse 32, for your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. There, now, therefore, notice the pleading, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. <clears throat> so who's speaking here? Judah, right? Judah's saying, I, I, I simply can't go home. Uh, my father will die. My father will die if Benjamin's not there. I've made a pledge. Um, please, Joseph, have mercy on me. Have mercy on us. We're not trying to steal from you. We're not trying to betray you. We're not spies. 
We're a hungry family from Canaan. Have grace on us. Have mercy on us. So I want you to, I want you to, um, I love the, the, the account of Joseph because it's so, um, I want to keep reading, right? 45, but I can't because it's, it's what we're doing in this curriculum. Now, some of you know how this all plays out, but um, it, all the details here, that are given to us in the life of Joseph. Now, beautiful illustration, take home point, what it means for a family to come back together, right? Joseph eventually, well, I can't say it. Um, some of you know. Um, if you wanna keep reading, I won't make you stop. Um, I wanna keep reading and I wanna keep talking and ruin the movie for you, right? So. I won't ruin the movie for you, but uh, our time is up this morning. I appreciate the Beautiful. comments. Beautiful. Yes. Yes. Mm hmm Yeah. Great point. Uh, Judah, remember Judah stuck up for for Joseph too, right? Don't kill him, right? Don't put him to death earlier when he was 17. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the word that fills our hearts and challenges us to be more like Jesus and help us, Father, to be faithful in all our dealings with other people. Help us, Father, to uh, enjoy the message of these truths and to store them up in our hearts and to see the different moving parts that in all things we may glorify you. In Christ we pray.